Big. So next on the floor, we have Patrick Duggan. Uh, he's from the environmental crime section of the U.S. Department of Justice. So over to you, Patrick. Thank you. I think that was a, a perfect segue into what I'm going to talk about because Peter talked about coordination between countries. And then we just heard the term uh, developing country, which I think that uh, Antonio would disagree with. And what he used yesterday was the term over-consuming and under-consuming. And uh, I'm here from the U.S., and we are certainly an over-consumer, if not the over-consumer. But I would propose another definition as it relates to marine resources, and that is an over-consuming nation or nations and supplier nations. And, and the reason I think that that's appropriate here is because, especially with our marine resources, a lot of what we consume is coming from this area, but also when you talk about over-consuming and supplier, that denotes the relationship. And that's what we need to have between our country and many of your countries is a relationship. Let's see if I can get this to work. All right. So I'll briefly, um, that was my introduction, so I'm past that. We'll talk a little bit about uh, trends in marine resources and then focus on, the, on the, the meat of this, which is international cooperation and how that applies to the, the people here, judges, prosecutors, and other environmentalists. And if we have time, we'll talk a little bit about some successful international cases. So here's the situation as we've seen it in the US, and you may have seen it here. This is what fishing was like in Florida back in 1957, and again in 1958. And we fast forward to 1983, exact same place. Fast forward again, 2007. This is what you get from that same port in Key West. And this is where we are as an international community. Well, why is that? It's because we, as an international community, are consuming more. And some of the big issues, or the, the big uh, resources are swordfish, bluefin tuna, shrimp and prawn, crabs, lobsters. You see these marine resources on menus every day. You see it in fast food now, and then you see it in restaurants and all over the place. It's a staple all over the world now. And then we're also seeing an increased demand in art and jewelry and mining of marine resources. So here's just some examples. This is a very cheap fast food restaurant in the US and all of this shrimp that they're serving, no, I should say not all of it, but none of it comes from the US. And it's very likely that most of it is coming from the Southeast Asian and Asian Pacific region. We have shark fin, which is served now all over the world. You can find that in New York City. You can find it in Tokyo. Uh, this is actually a picture from Palau. And these are all shark fins on the ground. And then we've got coral art, especially black coral, which has just uh, skyrocketed in terms of the value and the use of black coral. Yesterday, uh, someone brought up a question about what to do from the demand side. Well, again, as an over-consuming nation, we are the demand. And here are the options that we currently have. We have the Lacey Act false labeling. We have Lacey Act trafficking, the US Endangered Species Act, smuggling, and CITES. And what all of those have in common is that if something is illegal in the place it was taken, we can then charge the people who are bringing it into the US with a crime. 
But in order to do that, we need to know that it was illegal. And so that brings us to a legal problem, and this is where we really need to focus on the relationship between the U.S. and the supplier nations. And if you look here, you could potentially have five different countries involved in one illegal transaction because fish could be caught in the seas of country A, it then may be shipped to another country to be processed, it could be processed there, then shipped to a stopping point where it is, becomes a consumer good, and then finally, shipped to the consumer. And you can see that most often with bluefin tuna, where it's caught all over the world. It's often processed once it's caught, then shipped to uh, Tokyo, where it is sold and then shipped back out around the world. But let's say that final country, the consumer country, is the United States. The United States needs to know whether or not the fish was illegal in the first country. And how can we know that? Fish often look the same whether they're legal or illegal. And you can often catch a fish legally and then catch the same fish in a different season illegally. And that's where the role of Asian judges and prosecutors and environmental organizations, the people who are really the stewards of these marine resources, that's where your role comes into play. And the role is not the most difficult one. It is sharing information. And that's why conferences and symposiums such as this, the other ones put on by ASEAN WEN, and the various other organizations, Freeland. That's why they're so important, because it gives us a chance to share this information. But there's another role, especially for the judges here. And this is where the, the burden really falls on your shoulders. And the reason is that, as I mentioned, illegal fish might look exactly the same as illegal fish. You might be able to fish for tuna until July, but then from July to August, it's illegal. So it's very likely that that illegal fish is actually going to be, that the crime there is going to be a paperwork violation. They may have lied about when it was caught. They may have lied about how much it weighed. And so for the judiciary, it becomes extremely important to treat these paperwork violations where someone is just lying about where it came from or how much it weighed. You have to treat those violations the same as if a criminal were brought into court holding a fish that you knew was endangered and illegal. Because the outcome is the same. Whether they're caught with a fish or they're caught with paperwork that's false, they're still stealing from our international resource, from our marine environment. And that's an issue in the United States, as it's going to be an issue in every one of your countries, as there will be crimes where you have the person caught red-handed, and there will be crimes where you catch them three months, three years later, and it's all just paperwork. So. With that being said, um, I'm just going to go through a few brief examples of successes that we've had at the U.S. Department of Justice, specifically within my section, the Environmental Crime section, and uh, as it relates to international cooperation. First, uh, Operation Black Gold. This is very relevant to the uh, Asia Pacific region. Black coral is very rare, but it does occur here. It occurs in uh, very deep waters where there's very little light. And what was happening was black coral is being purchased in Taiwan, in Taipei, by two uh, Taiwanese nationals. It was then being shipped to St. Thomas, 
as, which is part of the U.S. Virgin Islands. It was being processed there, then turned around and being sold all over the world. And through multiple uh, avenues of international cooperation in four or five different law enforcement agencies from four or five different countries, we were able to stop shipments of illegal black coral. We were able through the Fish and Wildlife DNA Lab to identify that it was illegal Asian black coral. We were then able to bring, to lure in the Taiwanese, Taiwanese nationals into US jurisdiction, arrest them, and they pled guilty. And the, between them and a few other associated individuals, they received 51 months of imprisonment in the US and a total of $5.6 million in fines. Now the next thing, the next thing I'm going to talk about and the last thing is that those fine numbers. And that's another place where the relationship between the US and your countries becomes very important. Because in the last three or four years, the US, and, and again our section specifically, has been pushing to use these fines that we receive in a way that benefits the countries that were harmed, your countries. And the judiciary in the U.S. has agreed with us. And this is the landmark case, uh, United States v. Bengis, where, in essence, the lobster was stolen from South African waters, shipped into the U.S. Because those were South African lobsters, we were able to give all of that fine money back to South Africa, back to the country, and specifically to their natural resource uh, agencies. So in conclusion, we in the US as, as an overconsumer have a relationship with our suppliers. And we need to make sure that that relationship is strong and that information remains free flowing. And so I'd like to open the door to all of you judges, prosecutors, anyone else to contact us, stay in contact with us, and please feel free to bring any issues of an international matter to our attention. And we'll do all we can in our power to help you protect your resources. Thank you. Thank you, Pete.